So I guess a lot of biblically literate people hear a lot about Proverbs 31 as describing the ideal wife. Can you say more about this and who this really is? Or do you have a different interpretation as, as versus the popular interpretation? You know, it's interesting that, that this piece actually makes its way through both like Christian, modern sort of Christian and Jewish um, communities in totally different ways. So I, I can sort of report that um, on Friday nights, this is a uh, Proverbs 31, which is called Eshet Chayel by the first two words of the poem is actually sung um, by, by the family or sometimes the husband to the wife who had prepared the Sabbath meal. And it's sort of like a, a thanks. It's, a, it's like a song in thanks of, you know, all of the making the chicken and polishing the floor and blah, blah, blah. Of course, that, that's definitely not my take of the poem. Okay. But I'd be interested first to hear about how, I mean, how this poem sort of makes its way also into Christian communities. So one uh, day I would associate this with would be Mother's Day. So similarly in which this passage might be read to celebrate women and in particular women in that particular role, right? Of the married woman who is wise, who has overseen her household in a, you know, a wise way and has kept things orderly and is bringing praise to her husband and her household. So that would be one might be associated with weddings or celebrations of a particular woman in the community, especially in the context of marriage, like a renewing of vows, something like that. So those are the, the places I think would generally hear that being preached on or spoken on or used in church settings. But is there like, see, what, what's interesting to me, I think you know what I'm getting at here. What, what's interesting to me is um, if you read the poem itself, and, and it actually is, it's strange because it's, it's been completely ripped out of its literary context. Right. It's the conclusion to the book of Proverbs, which is in, you know, the writing section of the, you know, the Pentateuch, the prophets and the writings, where we have the book of Proverbs, which is a collection of sort of like the best wisdom of Israel, right, um, <laughs> in different collections. And then this is like the alphabetic acrostic poem that concludes the whole book. Yeah. And it's all couched as kind of instruction given from a father to a son. And then at the end, we have this sort of like strangely placed, seemingly, mm. alphabetic acrostic of, you know, seemingly a, the perfect wife. It, it actually yeah. has a little bit of like a militaristic sense to it. It's like Eshet Chayel, a woman of strength or of like might. Oh. It has been translated valor or a worthy woman, because it has this, this sort of like valence of both um, wealth or material wealth and also um, like physical strength and might. What's interesting to me is that the woman who's described in this poem does not seem like a human. <laughs> the reason I say this is because she's doing everything. I mean, like the woman doesn't sleep. Right? Like, right. It's like she gets up early, you know, to take care of her household. She doesn't, you know, she doesn't even go to sleep at night. She keeps working. Like, who, who is this lady? Yeah. Right. Um, is this, you know, I wonder if in sort of in Christian circles, that this is sort of like a model of what to strive for. Like, do all the work while your husband sits at the gates and gets all the praise. Not in so many words. <laughs> <laughs> but it, yeah, absolutely set up as an ideal. Yes. Yeah. So... What I think is interesting is to recontextualize it in, in, in the, its literary context of the book of Proverbs. Because as I said, it's instruction from father to a son. And what we have interspersed in these instructions of father to son in chapters one through nine of Proverbs mm -hmm. is also these two kinds of figures of women, right? And, they're, and, and neither of them are human, right? We have personified wisdom, which is really funny because, you know, the Hebrew word for wisdom, chokhmah, is grammatically feminine. So you can, it can be personified, yeah. right? But also folly, right, is also grammatically feminine, ivelet. So you have these two, um, you know, people don't fall into like neat categories like this, like you are personified wisdom, you are personified folly, right? It's like the world doesn't work like this. We do seem to have sort of at the end of Proverbs, before this alphabetic acrostic, is an instruction also. 
But this time it's not from father to son. It's from mother to son. And everyone forgets that this is part of this whole context of this poem. And it's the mother telling a son, essentially, how to rule, so not to, not to drink, to keep his head straight, and how to find a, a proper kind of wife. And so it recontextualizes the advice, not to women on how to be a good wife, but rather to a husband yeah. on how to make correct choices. Mm -hmm. And so I think that this is sort of a running theme of our conversations here, that in the Hebrew Bible at least, we always have to think not only of sort of how a characterization fits the literary context and plot and how it's moving a story forward, but also who's the audience that it's serving, right? This is clearly an audience of men and not an audience of women. When we start thinking about who are these women that show up as stock characters throughout all of this wise advice, it's sort of um, very flat and from a male perspective because like, among women, we wouldn't say like, oh, she's a, she's a Tamar. <laughs> she's a, you know, she's a, a, she is personified wisdom. Oh, but that one's personified folly. Or, that one is a woman of valor. Or, like, yeah. that's not the way that, that um, women as thinking subjects. Right. You don't speak in stock characters about <laughs> ideals that we should embody. Exactly. Right. right. And so I think when you start thinking about it as wisdom as part of a correct choice on the part of male readers, then it starts making sense that this is sort of like, like as you would choose a wife who would sort of bring your household to its best, uh -huh. right? That like, you know, let wisdom work for you, right? Let this woman take your household and bring it to like the best thing that it could be choose wisdom instead of choosing sort of a short-term, you know, something that has short-term gains. Yeah. Because the end of the poem actually says something really interesting, which is, I was going to look it up, but I know it, so why would I? I know it in Hebrew, I'm translating into English. Um, Grace is a lie and beauty is ephemeral, right? So it's just like this strange thing at the end of the poem. It's like it's, it's told you about how this woman has come into being, right, after, you know, he's chosen her. Um, and, you know, he, she's built up this household. She's given back to the community. You know, no one goes hungry. Everyone's in crimson. You know, like everything's great, right? And then it says at the end, grace is a lie or a deception. Mm -hmm. and, and beauty is ephemeral. But a woman who embodies sort of, I'm, now I'm loosely translating, the fear of the Lord, she shall be praised. And so it's about correct choice, right? Mm -hmm. You choose the, the path that leads you towards this sort of whole wisdom concept of fear of the Lord as opposed to this, you know, this idea of, well, something that looks externally beautiful but actually doesn't have any substance to it um, in the end. So there are several layers to this, right? So you have the teaching of how to make correct choices, but then also the content of the correct choice is being given at the same time, right? That this wisdom is yeah. going to do this. So very far removed from then the idea that this serves as a prototype for an ideal woman. Certainly, yeah. certainly, because wisdom, as you say, is sort of operating on these multiple levels. One of the levels is just on the very like simple level of advice. Like if I say like, oh, hey, th there's a ditch there. Don't, don't, don't walk near that ditch while playing on your cell phone, right? Would be, you know, like on the level of life-saving advice, right? Right. Then if I sort of abstract that to say like, you know, don't be distracted while walking near ditches, Right? That's sort of like general advice that like you might be able to pass on. But then if you can sort of think about it also in terms of, you know, what is wisdom? When you start talking about abstract concepts like, you know, choose wisdom and not beauty, right? Mm -hmm. Like stop swiping, is it swiping left or swiping right? I don't know because I'm not on Tinder. And like, neither am I. Okay, well, swipe. Stop swiping. Stop swiping, right? Stop swiping and pay attention to where you're walking, right? So choose sort of substance or reality over what is not real, right? right? Um, and that becomes a, a wisdom concept. And then when, when that's articulated in like terms that 
are also very clever in terms of the language, then it becomes a, a linguistic thing too. And so it becomes about like your skill of speech. Yeah. And so wisdom is operating on all of these levels. And correct choice has to do with everything in, on every step of the way. And I think that it has a lot less to do with, oh, this is directly about, you know, the woman. Well, you know, the first instruction in the book of Proverbs is, a, um, is basically a father telling his son, don't join a gang. Well, that's not what we're supposed to take from it. Like, well, obviously don't join a gang, right? <laughs> right. But also, you know, there's a principle at right. work here. Yeah. And so I think thinking about the audience may help us sort of move away from problematic interpretations. Mm -hmm.